What's up, everybody? Troy Cartwright here. Welcome back to another episode of Ten Year Town. Listen. Do you hear that? That's the sound of a year going by. We did it. For every week, for the last year, we've shown up, and you'd never know it, but there were a lot of weeks where we thought we might not make it. But together with Mary Lou, our creative director, and producer Ben, we've made it happen every single week. I don't know what it means, but I know I've enjoyed it, and I know we got many miles left to go. But most of all, I just wanted to say thanks. Today's guest is my dear friend, Adam Doliak. Me and Adam have been out on the road a little bit this year, and I can attest firsthand to what a great songwriter, entertainer, and overall human being this guy is. You know him from songs like Famous. He's also had cuts with Dan and Shay, Darius Rucker, Laney Wilson. He's got a new record dropping this Friday. This is one of the more insightful conversations that we've had into the music business and what it takes to be an artist in 2024. So without further ado, here he is, Adam Doliak. You guys don't play songs on here, do you? No. Okay. I, I almost brought my guitar. I was like, I don't think I've ever seen anybody no. play one. We've never done it. As an avid listener of the show. I mean, never seen I don't, play I, one. like, I'm just making a show I want to listen to. I'm not sure I like. Well, it's if like, you did do, it for, you'd have to do it for some people and not others, which would be a little awkward. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like there's an, there's another podcast that they, they do play and I'm like, I don't know. Sometimes it's good to like, uh, Alicia Keys did. Oh, the no, Super no. Bowl. I think I think it was Nora Jones did <laughs> Dax Shep, Dax, the uh, Armchair Expert podcast. Did she play on she it? She played. Was it weird? No, it was incredible. Oh, okay. She sounds. I mean, I would imagine it would be exactly as you would want her to sound, and it's awesome. It was like a bonus <laughs> at the end. Like, oh my god, would you really play for us? And she played, and it was amazing. Did she? Were they like? Oh, we just happened to have this piano perfectly set. No, up? she was playing on guitar, Dang. which was also cool. She's so talented, bro. She's so good. That was an interesting time in music. Because it was like the biggest artists in the world were Nora Jones, John Mayer, Jack Johnson for some yeah, reason. Yeah, yeah. And like, was it like Colby Calais? All sounds good to me. Yeah. I just, I, I'm trying to imagine like turning on your pop radio and like, that's yeah. what's happening. I guess there was like Backstreet Boys and stuff in there too. There's a lot of stuff happening. Yeah. John Mayer was always my largely, my <laughs> large focus, but yeah. Same. Is this this is one of the podcasts where you just start? Do you just start talking and then you just click play at any point? And you don't know when. It yeah, starts? well, I I always start off with the same question, but like, yeah, sometimes if it's interesting, we just keep it rolling. It's called a rolling start. Rolling start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so no, if you have anything really incriminating you want to say, say it now. Now would be a good time. <laughs> we can cut that out. It's funny you said Jack Johnson. You know how music just takes you places. Or mm -hmm. that what was the was it Banana Pancakes the Yellow record? Yeah, that was right when. Hurricane Katrina hit, uh, and I was in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. This was 2005, because mm -hmm. this is back when I was a golfer, and my, me and my dad were on the way home from a golf tournament in Georgia, and we got word there was going to be this terrible hurricane yeah. come through, and so we were able to stop and get the generator and everything and get back home to Hattiesburg, Yeah, and so sure enough, it came through. We were stuck in our neighborhood for six, six days, I think. Wow. It was wild. Like people showering, bathing, shaving in the neighborhood pool. Really gross stuff. Really gross stuff. Like the end of the world, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Because we couldn't get off of our street. You could walk down to the pool, but and, you couldn't drive. And off. why couldn't you? Was it like trees, trees were down? Yeah. Dang. I mean, Katrina was a real deal. Like I saw trees sideways out of my window at the house flying through the air. D like during. Legitimately during the hurricane. Because we didn't leave. Yeah. We were an hour north of the Gulf. So and it we was were, just still. And it's still, we were still trapped. I can't imagine what it was like in New Orleans or Gulf Coast or Mississippi. But that record was, we sat in the driveway every <laughs> night and we listened to that record, yeah. the Banana Pancakes. And Dang. so Jack Johnston is, I mean, I love him to death, but he's like Hurricane Katrina. Yeah, weird, weird association. Yeah, weird association. But I still love it. Yeah. He was like the first guy that, you know, we try to make music for the masses all the time. Mm -hmm. He was like the first guy that basically, there's a time and a place 
and a vibe that you listen to Jack Johnson. Yes. And that's it. And that's like it. Like he just does the one thing and that yep. was plenty. There's everybody apparently wanted to feel that vibe at some point, but yeah, he made uh you know, he just made music that you want to listen to when you're like feeling it's, it's much more specific than just like uh, Jimmy Buffett. Jimmy yeah. Buffett's like tropical. Jack Johnson is like, I, I want to know what it's like to surf. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he really figured it out, didn't he? <laughs> he just makes music. He goes and plays festivals here and there, tours like once every two years and yeah. surfs. He's figured it out. What's wrong with that? I don't know. Nothing. Um, well, I always start this thing off with the same question, which is uh, how long have you been in town? I've been in town since October of 2012, so 12, almost, almost 12 years, 12. 11 and a half years or so. And then the first year for me was a lot of, I was coming from Mississippi and coming from playing a lot of shows in that Southeast region. Yeah. And so I would come up for two weeks and try to meet some people, try to write some songs. And then I would leave for two weeks and I would go play shows in the Southeast and Georgia and Alabama, Florida, Mississippi, basically go pay some bills. And yeah. then I'd come back and write some songs and then go pay some bills. I wasn't in Nashville living completely, I would say, until about a year later, 13 or so. Okay. And when you were playing these shows, were you were these like your like when I started, it was like the four three hour cover. Yes. You know, maybe you slip some originals in there. Yes. It was I think it was the time slot was always four hours, right? Like six to ten. Yeah. Or ten to two. Kind of yeah. like it is on Broadway in Nashville. Yeah. Um, but yeah, play for an hour, 30 minute break, play for an hour, 30 minute break, break, play for another hour, which is like, when I think about now, Dude. you know, 90 minutes seems like a long time now, like four <laughs> yeah. hours, but yeah, I was playing, you know, restaurants. I was playing people's backyards, going away parties, graduation party, really anywhere that would hire me. Yeah. And I could go collect cash because I was a business major too. And so I, of course, love music and always have, but I also loved the making money aspect of it. Like, yeah. you can go play eight gigs this week and make this much dollars in cash. Yeah. It was cool. I liked that. So I was hustling. And I was also, during that time, still working at my dad's electrical company. Okay. So I was kind of a hack electrician for most of my life, honestly. I worked yeah. every summer and all that stuff and playing at night. So I was just kind of collecting as much money as I could. And really that's kind of what allowed me to buy my first house in Nashville, which was kind of wild. But oh, that's awesome. Yeah, dude. I, there's one story I tell every night on stage and it's, there's a song called The Puzzle of Us. Yeah. And I, it's one of my favorite stories behind songs. And so I was in one of these random situations, a biker bar in Daphne, Alabama. Yeah. So you can imagine Adam Doliak, you know, singing love songs to a bunch of bikers in, in South Alabama. Right. Not the best fit in the world. <laughs> and I was on one of those breaks. I, I was taking a 30 minute break and sitting at the bar having a beer next to this guy who I seemingly had nothing in common with. He's yeah. 300 pounds, tattooed from head to foot, leather vest, leather chaps, definitely rode to the bar on a Harley. And I see he's got this tattoo and he's, you know, you can see every piece down his arm, mm -hmm. all the little pieces put together and he had left one piece out. And so uh, that was kind of my conversation starter. It's like, Hey man, why'd you leave that piece out of your tattoo? And he kind of looks at me in this tough guy way. He's like, well, hold on a second. I'll tell you. I'm like a little bit scared. Yeah. And sure enough, this woman comes walking out of the bathroom and sits down next to him and she has leather chaps, leather vest, the whole, the same look no tattoos except for this one puzzle piece and yeah. it's in the same place that <laughs> this biker had left out of his and it blew my mind i didn't know bikers could be that sweet to one another truly i, I was like well maybe i have more in common with this guy than i thought it's amazing and that was one of my one of the first examples of me kind of falling in love with being on the road and meeting different kinds of people and having these conversations and that being the fuel to the songs that I would go back to Nashville and write. Yeah. And it was kind of a cool lesson and they can come from anywhere. I say it on stage every night. I'm like, this song's inspired by two bikers in South Alabama who have no idea they inspired this song. Yeah. And it's been a cool thing. And it's like the beauty, the beautiful thing about songwriting Yeah, is like you can get inspiration anywhere. Anywhere. And it, it's often for me, I don't know if you're this way, but it does. The final product is telling a story. It's not always the story that happened that inspired the idea. You know, right. it's I, I try to find the emotion in whatever happened, what it made me feel, and then maybe it wasn't about a guy and a girl or a relationship, and you can kind of take that emotion and put it in there. Yes. And as long as the song's still making you feel whatever you felt when you wrote that down, I always kind of feel like it's a win. Yeah, there's like a um, there's like some nugget of truth. Yes. that you take with you. Yeah. And then that is the 
one of the beautiful things about co-writing, you take it in and it becomes something else. Right. But you're always trying to sort of pinpoint whatever that emotion was Mm -hmm. or is. And then, yeah, it kind of takes on a life of its own. Yeah. It's, and John Mayer said that one time years ago, I think he said something like, I never like to, he doesn't really ever reveal the person that it's about because he he tries to maybe keep it just, this is what it was about, but not who it was about. Because that way you put these songs out and, you know, say it was about a relationship when you were in love. And if it was about that person and everybody knows it's about that person and then you guys break up or something, it kind of ruins the song for any time after that. And if it's just about falling in love, whoever comes along and finds this song and falls in love with it can listen to it for that instead of it was about this person, which I always liked. Yeah, they can. Anybody can put themselves yeah. in the song. Yeah. Um, well, let's go back a, a little bit. So you're you're in college, and had were you playing in bars the whole time, or no. was that sort of after school ended? Well, wait, wait, very much after. I was okay. not even playing a guitar or singing while I was in college. Okay, you weren't. No. So I I basically at like twelve or thirteen years old started playing golf. I, I, I can't remember why, but I decided I wanted to play golf in college. Yeah. And so me and my dad every weekend throughout junior high and high school, we're kind of on tour, I guess, now that I think about it, we were just going to golf tournaments every weekend. We go to different cities and I go play in the AJGA or SJGA and I would compete. And that was pretty much every weekend, me and my dad on the road in a hotel room. Never thought about that until now. That's kind of yeah. almost the same thing I do these days. Yeah. Um, So it started with golf. I ended up doing that. I got a full ride to play golf. I got offered that full ride my junior year of high school. Fast forward about a year later, I had played every sport growing up. So I had played baseball up until I was 12 or 13. And I quit when I decided to really chase golf. Yeah. And my friends, basically, they had a good team at at the high school that year. They needed like one more guy. And I'm like, why don't you come play this year? And I remember I was on the basketball court. I left the basketball court to go out. I fielded a bucket of balls at third base, hit a bucket of balls in the cage, and then started in a baseball game that night. Oh my God. Because I was at a smaller school, like you could do that sort of thing. Yeah. And I've always been an athlete, so I was, I was it'll be fun, I'll do it. Long, you know, after that, I had a good year. I was left-handed, um, 6'4", had potential. I think that's probably why I got my scholarship, but I ended up having a good year that year somehow. Hit over 400 with like 10 or 15 home runs. And then Southern Miss offered me a baseball scholarship. Gotcha. And when my coach told me, I literally laughed and told him to shut up. I, like, <laughs> I, thought, it was, I thought it was a joke. I was yeah. like, I'm going to play golf, whatever. And I'm a big kind of gut feeling type of person. So I just, I felt like if I'm going to stumble into baseball and get offered a scholarship to Southern Miss, who's top 25 in the country yeah. at the time, um, I feel like I should do it. That stuff doesn't just happen, you know? And I was, and I figured in my head, I'm like, I can play golf until I'm 90 years old. Yeah. And so I did. I called the golf coach who didn't even know I played baseball and told him, never mind, I'm going to take this baseball scholarship. <laughs> and uh, I went and did that. And three years later, walked into the College World Series, got to play in that. And playing in front of that crowd, I kind of give credit for fueling this desire for me to be on stage and play music. It was, it was probably the biggest rush I'd ever felt. Yeah. Um, you know, it was 25,000 people. You're walking into Rosenblatt back then and you don't really forget that feeling. Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of how this all slowly started. And, and I've played drums my entire life since I was two years old. I've had a drum set. My dad played, my older brother played. And so I've always been a music lover. Um, but my teammates, all played guitar basically baseball players probably to try to get girls they played acoustic guitar sure and that's how it started i was drumming with them and then they would leave the house and i would pick up their guitar and kind of start noodling around and they one by one kind of kept saying things like hey man you actually have kind of a unique voice or Mm. a cool voice yeah um and you know you should sing in front of people and to which i responded absolutely not that sounds terrifying i don't want to sing in front of anybody and I wasn't going to. They actually went and booked me three shows around my hometown. Yeah. Little bitty bars, you know, just whatever. Three acoustic shows came home and said, well, now you have to show up. We booked yeah. you shows. And I did. And they all sold out, not because I was any good at singing at that at that time, but because people knew me from the baseball world. Yeah. And so I did. I showed up. I sang. I don't know if it was any good, but I fell in love with it. And, um, you know, when it was time to decide 
uh, should I go play professional baseball, which I, I got drafted, but it was, you know, nothing to brag about really late. Yeah. Back then there were 40 rounds. I think I was like 38 or something oh like gosh. that. So it was like basically a, a glorified invitation. Yeah. Um, so I decided, you know, should I go do, I, I looked at it as the minor leagues of baseball or the minor leagues of music. Cause that's yeah. kind of how Nashville is when you get here. And I, you know, I'd kind of had enough of it. I was a little bit burnt out somehow, even though I didn't play long and yeah. I was really loving the music thing. And so I moved to Nashville. Wow. So it was very late. I, I did not, I'm not one of these guys who's been writing and singing since birth. Yeah, and yeah. this is, I knew this is what I wanted to do. Did you, at that point when you moved here, had you started writing songs? Yeah. I, I had written like five songs with my teammates. Yeah. I mean, literally there's a guy named Travis Graves who I still talk to one of my, one of my best friends and he would just kind of start writing these songs and he would shoot them over to me and then I would kind of finish them. And we had a couple, I had six songs on an EP Yeah, and you know, normally when you put out an EP, you're picking your best stuff. I literally only had six songs. <laughs> <That was laughs> I, all just, I put them all on the EP and we put it out. I had a release party in Hattiesburg, um, kind of still at the end of my baseball run. Yeah. And again, it sold out. It was so fun. Um, and I, I just kind of fell in love with that thing that music does where you get to you know, make something out of nothing and then you get to go yeah. play it for people and see them react and I fell in love with it. And so, yeah, I had a few songs. One of them kind of went viral on YouTube back in the day. It was yeah. a song called Travel On and it had, you know, over, it was like 500,000 views. It's a which ton. back then, yeah, I was like, oh my God, that's, that's incredible. Yeah. So I had a little bit of, you know, some tiny little success pieces to grab onto that that kind of made me believe, well, maybe this thing will work. Yeah. As as the music industry does, it just dangles. Hope is a dangerous thing sometimes. Yes, you know? it's uh, it's dangling it on a carrot. It just dangles right there, just out of reach uh -huh. every now and then. Yeah. Um, wow, that's such a that's such. A, I didn't ever know that about you, about your your story. So yeah, the, the College World Series go, is going on right now. I, I don't know when this is going to air, but it it when we did this, it was going on. And yeah. Um, I posted a clip of me in the College World Series hitting a double against Texas a couple days ago. Yeah. And it's been really fun. I, I kind of, you know, you assume people know, because I've talked about it in interviews and all kinds of things over the years. And you assume people just know these things, but there's so much stuff out there that people miss a yeah. lot. And so I've heard from so many people that were like, I'm such a bigger fan now. I had no <laughs> idea you were like a baseball player in the College World Series. So yeah. it's been fun for people to see that. And it's still fun for me to watch those clips. It feels like a different lifetime ago, but it's, it's yeah, so it fun. Is. It's like still, basically is another life. That it, it was. I yeah. still get jacked up though. I, I still love baseball. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, well, talk to me about, so you moved to Nashville. Um, do you like, how much do you know? Do, what were you like, I'm trying to get a publishing deal. I'm trying to get a record deal. Like where was your head at, at the time? I was coming from that baseball world where I really loved performing in front of people. Mm -hmm. And so honestly, when I moved to Nashville, I don't think that I really cared about writing songs. Yeah. I wanted to be the guy singing the songs and I wanted to write the songs to get to the point where the song did well and would allow me to sing the song. Yeah. But as far as, you know, falling in love with songwriting, I was not there when I moved here at all and didn't really expect to get there. And that's been kind of a lovely thing about Nashville is I did really fall in love with Nashville. When I got here, I would say I was 95% want to be on stage singing the song, 5% cared about writing it. Yeah. And that has all the way up to 50-50, if not maybe a little higher on the songwriting side now of like, man, I love writing a good song. There's yeah. really no feeling like that writing a song, walking out of the room and really thinking you got something. Yeah. Cause we write so many and it's, it's not, it's not every day. The bar just raises every day. So it gets a little bit harder. And that feeling of writing a song, um, is, is one of my favorite feelings in the world now. So it yeah. was, it, that's been a big change from me getting here to me now, but there's still nothing quite like writing it, being in the room that day, watching it come to fruition in the studio, wherever it might be, and then going out on the road and then seeing people sing it back. That full circle thing is amazing. Yeah, yeah it never, it never really gets old when you, yeah. when you like, I, that still hits me all the time. Like I'll be on stage singing a song and you know, you peep, you see people singing it back and it's like, how did this happen? Yeah. This, feel, this is like, this is magic. That's why we do it. Yeah. It's, it's so rare that it does happen, but it, when it does, it's 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 the it's the good shot in golf on the 18th hole mm -hmm. when you're just you're never gonna play again. You're you're about to quit golf. You've been frustrated <laughs> for 17 holes in a row, and then you just stripe a drive right down the middle. Yeah, it keeps and you it keeps back. you coming back for at least another year or so. No doubt, that, that's like the musical equivalent. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
So, yeah. So how did it sort of, uh, you know, what was the, the next, the next move, I guess. Well, for the first couple of years I was here, I didn't have a deal. I didn't have a job here. I've, I've been fortunate. I've only done music since I have moved to Nashville. That's yeah. been my only job. And I feel really lucky about that. And as a form of success, I try to not forget that there's a lot of different levels, but, um, first couple years, it was just trying to meet people, get in rooms with people, make friends, you know, find a circle of people that I liked. Um, I remember like Mitchell Tenpenny was one of the first guys I met and I walked in his house and I saw a John Mayer record on the wall and yeah. I was like, okay, we're going to be buds. Like we just finding people that think what you think is cool is also cool. That's, that's kind of, there's a lot of different versions of good, right? Right. People think whatever's good. Like look at fans of music. There's no wrong answer. Just everybody thinks different things are cool. And so finding those people. Um, and then after that, I think I signed my, pu- my first publishing deal in 2015 with okay. Sony where I still am. So I've had the same deal the entire time I've been in town. Yeah. Um, and it was very indicative of Nashville. I, I always say Nashville is a million no's with <laughs> little bitty yeses attached. Mm-hmm. And that's what happened. We had started playing um, some shows. You know, back in the day, you would go do what's called a showcase and you would invite these labels out and you would go play in this room, which is a terrible idea now that I think back because they're just, it's this room with no crowd. Just business executives standing there. They will the, not smile. The vibe the is vibe. atrocious. You've done it. It's awful. There's almost no way to succeed. Yeah. <laughs> There's no way. So yeah. anyway, we were doing a couple rounds of that. It was in a rehearsal space. So, you know, just brutal vibe. Yeah. And uh, we played for three or four companies, record companies that week. And this was back. My band was still half in Mississippi, half in Nashville. So my mm-hmm. band drove up from Mississippi I had hair down. I had hair about your length back then, really? believe it or not. Yeah. I got to see a picture. I, I'll find a picture for yeah. you. We'll, we'll pop that up. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we did that. And I got passed on, I think, by all three of those, I think it's three labels. I think they all said no. And the next morning, I got a call, and it was Troy Tomlinson at Sony, mm. uh, ATV at yeah. the time, publishing. And so got three no's, but I had... Troy happened to be there and he calls, he goes, Hey, I heard some of the songs you were playing yesterday. Why don't you come into the office and play some for me? And so I did, I showed up, I think it was a few days later, like pretty quick, Yeah. showed up and played some songs. And one of the songs I played, he stopped at the end. Troy, I don't know if you know Troy, but he will, he will cry if he hears a song good enough. Yeah. I always love that about him. He's, yes. He doesn't hide what he feels about it. And he stops me, puts his phone down, hits record and says, play that again. I'm like, okay, I'll play it again. And I played it again and finished it up. And he ended up picking up his phone. I'm like, what are you doing? He goes, I just sent that to Kenny Chesney. I think it'd be great for him. Mm. And I'm like, okay, well, this is pretty awesome. And while I'm in the room, Kenny Chesney hits him back and he goes, what the hell is that song? I want to cut that. Wow. And so I'm sitting there. I'm like, what? Am I about to get a Kenny Chesney cut day one before I even have a deal? Yeah. And... Ended up, he ended up recording it, I think, but it didn't make the record. So it was like a, you know, I got my hopes up. Didn't quite yeah. happen. But it was it was a yes that came from some no's. And obviously getting a text back from Kenny while you're in the room landed me my first publishing deal. Yeah. And that's kind of what started that. And once you get a publishing deal, you know, they start setting you up on what I like to call first dates. And you mm-hmm. go out and find your crew. See who you like. See who you want to go out on a second date with and a third and a fourth. And started doing that. And, and that led to... Basically, the next thing that happened was I became a highway fine for Sirius XM in 2017 Dang. Uh, with a song called Whiskey's Fine, which is still one of my favorites to yeah. sing today. It's a great song. Yeah. Uh, at that point, were you, did you feel like when you started writing, you were writing like always with the uh, intention of like, I'm writing songs to try and find that I can cut, you know, as an artist and grow your thing that way? Yeah. I think I've, I've never really sat down and aimed at anybody. Yeah. Every cut that I've gotten has really been just songs that I wrote that I was aiming at me mm-hmm. and other artists heard and they said, you know what? I think I like that for me. And and yeah. um that's kind of how it happened. But I've I've always I've tried, I guess. I shouldn't say I, hadn't, I have never tried because I have and failed. Anytime I've sat yeah. down, I was like, I'm gonna write a Luke Bryan song today. Yeah. It just you end up leaving without a cut for Luke Bryan and without something that you like, <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah, absolutely. I just try to stay true to what I think is cool and, and hope that, um, if it lands somewhere else, that, you know, someone else loves it too. Yeah. Um, so you become a, a highway find mm-hmm. and at this point, 
are you playing are you still playing a bunch of shows or because i'm curious how the like transition happens from like you know you have stuff going on but it's kind of stuff no one knows about and then you have a song on the radio or, yeah. or xm radio yeah and like how does that impact the the live show and stuff like that well i had played a lot of shows you know it's it's weird because now these guys are getting signed off social media and it's they've maybe never played shows yeah you just set a phone down and and do something over a song and you may get a million dollars and never have played a show yeah and the, and the label somehow doesn't care that you've never played a show <laughs> yeah. um but back then i mean i i played like 200 shows a year probably i mean granted they were in bars and acoustic shows but yeah. you still learn what works you learn how to kind of entertain people you learn you just learn what to do in a room right um i had done a lot i had not done a lot of you know proper nashville shows i've never been on a tour or anything like that and so the sirius xm highway fine led to me going on my first tour which was the highway fines tour it oh, was gotcha. i was opening Ashley McBride was in the second spot mm -hmm. and High Valley was the uh, headliner. Yeah. And I'll never forget the first show was in Washington, D.C. at the Hamilton. And I was just doing acoustic. It was me and, and Spencer Wasdorp, who's played guitar for me forever and ever. And um, I walked in and Ashley was sound checking. And my God, if you never heard Ashley live, you should because she's incredible. Yeah. I walk in and it just sounds so good. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, Jesus Christ, I need to make sure I'm on my game tonight. Because this is like, it was like another level of touring, right? You, you Well, you you start to see where the bar is. Yeah, the bar know? raised immediately, just yeah. during Ashley's sound check. And then she also raised the bar, just the human that she is. She was so awesome to be on tour with. Yeah, I would be doing VIP backstage uh, with some, We back then we do we only had like five or six. So we'd just bring him to the green room or something yeah, and play yeah, some yeah, songs. Yeah. And I would be playing, I never, she, I was playing a song called Everybody Needs Somebody. And she had heard it every night on tour. And so she just pops her head in and starts singing the harmonies to mm. everybody needs somebody for the VIPs. She she was she was really great to be on tour with first time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the bar just kind of continued to raise from then on. And the same thing happens. You you learn something. I try to learn something from every show that I do, whether yeah. it's the opener, whether you're the opener, whether it's something that you really didn't like that this person did or something that you love that they do. You just kind of keep grabbing things as you go. Um, and I've opened for a lot of people as of now. So you just, you just kind of grab their tricks and put them in your own show and yeah. keep growing it. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, so I guess like eventually you have some other songs that sort of do well on XM. And then at this point, like st streaming is really starting to matter. Right. Yeah. I'm trying to remember when that actually came in streaming because when when i first started on sirius xm it was you know you would watch the numbers of how many songs had sold on itunes yes absolutely it was and like that can was 2017 I get... so i mean 2019 is when famous came out and we were still doing that yeah streaming was happening but i remember it was still kind of more of an even battlefield totally um so yeah it, it kind of one thing led to another whiskey's fine was on my first ep and then there was some, you know, I had a manager at that time who ended up letting go. And so there was some turnover in that period where I got offered record deals. And that, that was the thing. There, there was a few record deals on the end of Whiskey's Fine kind of situation. Once that the Highway Fine was a big deal and people started noticing. Yeah. And so some, some record deals came about. But I turned them down. Um, and back then, it was a really difficult thing. And I had some people give me some good advice i think i can't take full credit for that but i yeah. turned them down which all i wanted since i moved to nashville was a record deal well what what was the advice don't just take anything mm. you know because these, these deals you know it's it's such a great feeling and such a high high when you the day you sign right but then it, if it's not the back end of it's not good it's like oh well that was fun but but what am i doing now i'm stuck on a shelf or you know yeah. it, they were more so development deals than they were we really, really think you got it. We want you. It was like, oh, we think you might get there. Like, why don't mm. you sign with us? And ended up not. And it was hard because, like I said, that's all I wanted. I wanted a record deal. Since the day I moved here, I wanted to call mom and dad or, or post on online, whatever it was. Like, yeah. Adam Doliak signs with just whoever. You right. know, I just wanted a record deal. And so I didn't and um, kind of played that out. The, the project kept growing. Um, I ended up firing a manager in that time. And in the meantime... Um, my manager 
who's still with me now, who came along after that, we were listening to this song called Famous. And um, we listened to it, God, I don't know, 500 times, 600 times. And we were like, this song this is, is the hit. one. This yeah. is a hit. It just has to be. We've listened to it so often. And um, again, this was back before you would tease. There was no, let me put it on TikTok <laughs> and see if it's a hit. Right. We just thought it was a hit. And um, that ended up coming out um, January of 2019. And that was the song that those deals went from, hey, we think we might want you to like, oh, we, we want you. Like, yeah. Please sign with us. And then um, it led to me signing my first record deal, I guess, in 2000, October, October, November of 2019. Perfect timing. Perfect timing, right before the entire world imploded <laughs> and the yeah. whole system just kind of redid itself. You know, nothing operated the same after COVID than it did before. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you want to, do you want to talk about your, your experience on the label or we just want to move along? I mean, it's the label is, it's so much timing. You know what I mean? I, I signed, yeah. I signed right before, um, right before COVID happened. I yeah. mean, nobody could see that coming. I lose sleep thinking about, you know, the way that everything is restructured now. Famous when I signed was almost gold independently. Yeah. It was, it was right there. Yeah. And so I got what I would have considered a really good record deal mm -hmm. at the time. But now looking at what's happening with, with uh, deals post COVID in this TikTok viral situation. Yeah. If I would have waited till COVID happened and had famous almost gold, I mean, I lose sleep thinking about what I yeah. could have gotten paid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I get that. Um, but yeah, the label, I, I'm not the type to, to, you know, talk too much trash. It's so much timing. Obviously some people, it works great for them. Yeah. Um, some people, some people it does not. And for me, it just, it never really added to the team. Yeah. It was, I, I was still doing all the work. I was still, you know, putting in all the hours. I just wasn't really, um, kind of getting to pick up the checks or I wasn't getting to, there were rewards, but they weren't coming to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and totally. so, and so that was, that was really tough. And it's just, you want people, I think what labels have kind of turned into is they kept saying while I was there, like this song needs to prove itself mm -hmm. or the music needs to prove itself. We'll go record these songs and then we'll, then we'll post about it and see if it proves itself. And in my head, I was like, no, no, like I, I proved myself when you signed me. Yeah. Like I already proved myself. You signed me because you believed in me and the music that I walked in with. Yeah. So what, there's something that's happening with labels where there is no belief anymore. And yeah. I think that's kind of, that's what I struggle with the most is like, do you, are you in or are you out? You yeah. Know? Yeah. I had a very like similar experience where it's like, okay, you signed me. And then it's like, well, wait, now I have to like make you like me again like i thought we already went through that and yeah, yeah it's just it can be you know for just for my my own personal experience it was it was frustrating yeah. is like the word that i would use but beauty of it is like it's it's a brand new world right now and there's a lot you know it's not used to be like you had to have a be on a label and then if you weren't on one anymore it was like you know the end of the world and that's absolutely yeah. not the case anymore as you're already proving yeah it can almost be the opposite of the case now it, yeah. it can be the end of the world if you're stuck on a label yes you know what i mean the yeah. momentum can slow all the way down to nothing and then that's a big part of nashville i think is momentum like yes. how do you keep it going because when it slows down it's like a full rebrand or redo yeah, like, yeah all right let's get started again <laughs> right um and so keeping that momentum is what i found to be the hardest thing while being at a label yeah and then it just you know you you know you went through it it's it's there's there's more what what this whole thing is about is creatives making music and there's for for people out there to impact people out there for fans yeah and we can see that so quickly. You can you can write we can write a song today, post it tomorrow, and probably know if it's something we want to run with. The problem is if you if you do that sometimes while you're on a label, it takes six months to get that song finally out. Yeah. Six months maybe quick. Right. You know, and and then by the time it's out, that moment maybe has passed a little bit where um nobody really cares about your project as much as you do. And and that's kind of should be your team. The more people you can find that are excited about your project and you can kind of, that want to be a part of it, that almost finds you. They're like, Hey, I heard this. I would love to be a part of it. Yeah. Keep them involved. And it's never personal. That's one of the hardest things about Nashville is like nothing's ever personal. No, it's not. It, it's easy to take it really personally, but it's, it's never personal. So just keeping that in mind. And yeah, for me, I, you know, I got out, I, I left, uh, 
late last year. Yeah. Towards the fall of last year. I didn't say anything about it. I don't ever like the look of this. Be, again, it's kind of like signing a bad record deal. It's like, it feels good when you do it. If you make a post about leaving the label. Oh, like, yeah. Oh, screw you label. Yeah. It's, it was never that. I, I just felt like for me, um, it wasn't the right place to be at the right you know, at that moment. I'm not against record labels. I'm I was against that one. Yeah, you yeah. know. But I, I think I'm not ruling out ever ever signing another one. I think there is probably a place that I would love. Absolutely, it's just timing and and the people you're working with, and yeah. obviously the state of even the world came into play in that one. You know, so yeah. it's uh, but it's been life changing in a good way for me. I mean, uh, it is night and day. I feel like I'm still working really hard, but I'm I'm working towards something that. I can benefit from and I can see, you know what I mean? Yeah. The it's, value is like accruing to you. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's like absolutely. you're, 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 you're working towards, you're making money that you're actually getting to keep as opposed to right. making money that you'll never see. And it's, 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 it's just way more fulfilling to work this way for me at, at this moment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And what, and you have like a, uh, and you've put out a few songs this year and you have a EP coming out, right? Yeah. Um, pretty soon. June twenty eighth. Yeah. Um, again, I don't know if this will be out by then. Uh, yeah, Probably. I think we're gonna. I think we're oh, gonna try right around then. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. June twenty eighth. There's an EP called About Time. Awesome. And the song's kind of written. Um, it's about time we do this. It's about time we do that. But oh, really, cool. the point of it is, it's about time. Life is about time. Yeah. And that that's my favorite thing to write about. I think everybody kind of has these topics they love to write about. Mm -hmm. Time is definitely mine. Um, how you spend it who you spend it with, yeah. who you waste it on, mm. what, what people you chase after for too long. Just, it all comes down to time. We don't, we only have, we have, we all have this hourglass that's just kind of rolling. Yeah. And it's funny cause we don't realize that we're running out of time until kind of later in life. Right. It's so you, it's just fascinating to me is, is how you spend time, but it's, it's a lot of more kind of love songs, more, more like what I normally do, love songs. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm in love and happily married and just had a kid. Yeah. And uh, so it's it's a lot of those emotions. And there's a little nugget at the end of it. It's my first time I've ever done an interlude. Oh, very on a cool. project. But the last song is called About Gone Interlude. And yeah. so um, I've got a I've got kind of another project in the mix called About Gone. Oh, and it's going to cool. be it's going to be more of that heavy stuff, more of those life songs, maybe some stuff about chances you didn't no second chances you didn't get back you know that yeah. kind of thing and so which i'm excited about because a lot of my career i've kind of turned into this love song guy a little bit which is fine i do really love love songs yeah and love um but i haven't really gotten to write towards heartbreak mm -hmm. um and some of the more more life songs more heavier lyric which are some of my favorite songs that i've yeah. got in the catalog so that's going to be a little bit of that so um it's exciting little 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 taylor swift nugget in there for the fans yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. little tease yeah a little tease um what are you like i i love what you're kind of describing about like i think every artist and songwriter we want to um sing about all different kinds of things and you know like you said it's easy to to like it's like well people like this type of song for me so i'm gonna do more of that, right? Um, yeah. But I think one of the things I really admire about you and from having opened up some shows for you and stuff is like, I feel like everything you do is very intentional. And so, um, I don't know, that's, that's gonna be exciting to hear how you're also like intentionally setting up like, hey, here's some stuff that you guys love and then it's like, we're gonna go a little deeper on this next one, so stick with me and like, let's go on a ride. And Yeah, and yeah. you know what people forget is they're all love songs. Yeah. Right. Like even even breakup heartbreak songs are love songs. I feel like they're just love gone badly. Yeah. Love love songs that you think of are love going great, but there's all there. You you don't really get upset about somebody leaving if you didn't love them. That's right. You know what I mean. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm I'm excited too. I mean, it's it's again back to the label stuff a little bit. Just a little more creative freedom comes from that. Mm -hmm. There's the longer you're in Nashville, the harder it is to just be yourself. Dude. <laughs> you know, like and and also. These, these artists that are happening, kind of coming up right now, I think have a little bit of, of an advantage as far as what that is. Because when I first started, and you were probably the same way, a country music artist was this thing. It was this shining, good looking, came in a package, mm -hmm. smile for everybody thing. Yeah. And that was what every one of them was. 
Yes. And I think what we're seeing now, obviously, is kind of the revolt against that. Like, that thing can be anything you want it to be. In fact, it's better if it's not the shining thing. Yes. Um, but it's, you have to talk about it a little bit. It's kind of hard when you, when you came up for years and years of trying to be this thing. Mm-hmm. It's not as easy as people would think to just know exactly who you are without that thing. Yeah. So that's been actually a little bit, it's kind of weird to say it's difficult, but like figuring out what I actually want to sing about and be and the whole branding of the whole thing without letting the thoughts of, oh yeah, but are, are they going to like this? Are they going to like this creep in is harder than it would might seem. You know what I mean? It's very, very hard to be yourself, to be yourself. And especially like you said, like the way we kind of came up in this Nashville system was like, uh, my buddy Martin Johnson always tells me, he's like, you know, you're a shampoo bottle and you go to the store and like, you know, there's, there's 20 kinds of shampoo, but you got to figure out what three things are going to like fit on the shampoo bottle. And I don't even know if that's, uh, if that's, that doesn't even really seem like it's the case anymore. You know, like there's a lot more freedom, but it's hard to like break out of that mental framework of like, Mm -hmm. I got to be this thing, you know? Yeah. Wow, Martin, what what a quote. <laughs> Martin's a good buddy of mine, too. Yeah. I'm going to have to tell him about the shampoo quote. That's yeah, something else. It's a great one. Um, what a rock star Martin is. God. He, uh, he, he's he got, a I think, right around a one-year-old. So we were sending each other pictures of our babies the other day. It's, yeah. it's, it's been really cool. Um, but yeah, it, it is. That's one thing that's just, you know, do you like it or do you not? Is it you or is it not? That's That's been, I've been lucky because I feel like me singing is got a unique thing to it about it which yeah. is which is good because like I've, been, I've the last few years since i've had music out that people know i'll be writing with people and we'll be writing the song and maybe the lyrics like 98 percent there and we go to sing the vocal and i'm like well we don't quite have this little section and the guys in the room will be like no it's okay just do the doliac thing to it mm. just sing it like you know do the doliac thing and i'm like yeah. what is that <laughs> so it's almost like you, you start to develop a thing right outwardly people are noticing it but sometimes you don't quite notice it yeah um and i've always been able to um kind of whittle down the songs that are adam doliak that's that's never been as hard as really just figuring out you know who you are on social media how much you talk like i i'm i'm very i'm just an outgoing person i like to stay after and talk to fans i like to be very personable with pretty much everybody in my life yeah and for the longest time there was just like you know, you got to play it cool. You got to be the artist thing. Mm-hmm. And I, I actually kind of love now that you just don't have to do that. You can be right in the face of, of your fans. You can talk yeah. to them. You can comment back. You can do all of that. Um, but it's it's definitely, you know, it's always changing. You are always changing. Yep. So you, you figure it out and then you, something changes and you, maybe that's not quite who you are anymore. Yeah. Um, you get to grow, you know? Yeah. But I, I do think I've done a, a pretty good job of not chasing after what's happening. Yeah at any given moment in time. Like I'm not going to, when Morgan Wallen pops off, I'm not going to go try to sound like Morgan Wallen. And, and and luckily I think I, maybe I would, but I only know how to sound like Adam Doliak. Yeah. And I think that's a blessing because I would probably go try to sound like somebody yeah. else. But <laughs> um, what comes out is just what comes out of me. It's just yeah. the way that it is. And it's got a little, you know, bluesy soulful thing that, that yeah. a lot of my favorite music, you know, I grew up listening to John Mayer and, Dave Matthews band, Amos Lee, Gavin DeGraw, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it's just kind of worked its way in. And um, I like to say, I mean, if, if some people, if anybody ever hears me as like John Mayer, Chris Stapleton had a baby, that's always my favorite. Those are, those are yeah. two of my favorite voices. You know? High praise. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Um, well, I got one last question for you and uh, kind of ask this at the end of every podcast, but if you had a, a piece of advice, if you could go back in time to younger you just getting started on on the journey, what would you, what would you say? Uh, what would I tell younger me? I, um, I think maybe the biggest piece of advice that I've learned is, is probably very simple advice, but Mm -hmm. it'd be one day at a time. Mm -hmm. I think it was really easy. I, you know, most people in this world are big dreamers. Um, we have this, this optimism this delusional optimism sometimes and so i certainly do yeah and so when you start dreaming and getting in your head about what this project's going to look like and where it's going to go and where it's going to land you're just you get so far ahead of yourself that sometimes it makes the when it doesn't go that way it makes it 
kind of really defeating, kind of yeah. feel like crushed and, and you want to give up. And um, I would say just one day at a time, pay attention to that day, write the best song you can that day, yeah. um, make the post that day, see if it does well. You just, there is no, there is no guideline for the music industry. Mm-hmm. Nobody knows what's going to happen. Nobody knows what songs are going to take off. And if you just try to stay in the moment and enjoy that, um, enjoy kind of the game of it. I think it's a lot more fun than I've just, I've been guilty of getting ahead of myself, uh, in, in the past. And it just, it kind of crushes you when it doesn't go the way you want it to go. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, I would just say, you know, don't, if you're scared of the word, no, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even attempt it. Don't even bother. <laughs> don't even bother. If, if you get defeated by hearing the word, no. And, and you know, I came from, uh, you know, I played baseball for one year and then went and played division one baseball. So yeah. it was an uphill climb the entire time. And so I actually, I don't know about you. I, I love the chip on my shoulder underdog vibe. That's, that's kind of what like keeps me going. Yeah. I love it. I still have it right now in the music industry. No doubt. Um, but if that doesn't excite you, the uphill climb and the, and the, I mean, we probably hear the word no 15 times a day. Yep. Easily 15 yeah. times a day. I don't know how, I don't know what the ratio of knows to one yes is but i bet it's i bet it's 500 (laughs) to a thousand knows to one yes yeah um and so that's just something i think everybody should know before they get into this because it's hard i mean it's a tough tough it's the hardest thing i've ever done and i've done a lot of things yeah definitely the hardest thing i've ever set out to do yeah um but it can be a good time if you love it yeah well it's such great advice because i think that's that's a lot of a lot of times when people get started they just don't realize like, yeah, everyone says it's hard, but it's like, it's hard because it's hard to do. It's also hard because you, you have to kind of reacclimate your brain to just knowing that it's, it is, it's mostly no, it it's is. mostly no with a few yeses sprinkled in. And yeah. like, you have to l- like kind of, I know for me, it's like finding the, um, like making sure like, I'm good. My belief in myself is always there. So even when someone t- says no or not right now or whatever, it's like, oh, okay, no problem. Right. They'll come around. Or, yeah. Or it goes back it to is. that taking it personal thing, right? Yeah. Like not only do you have to hear 15 no's a day, you have to not take 15 no's mm-hmm. personally a day. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's so hard. It's, you, it's, it's nowhere else does that really happen. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You're, someone's going to tell you no. And then like the likelihood that you're going to see them at Kroger and two days <laughs> yeah. is so high that you just have to be like, yeah, it's fine. They're not saying no to me. Yeah. They're just saying no to this thing making sense for them right now. And that's right. fine. Right. You know? Yeah. It's a, it's a crazy, crazy job to have. Yeah. This, this whole Nashville gig. But it goes back to one thing I was saying at the beginning. I mean, I've only made music for 12 years now. Yeah. And, and somehow we're here, we're sitting here talking and, and things have gone pretty well. And, um, and it's at the same time or 12 years in and I'm nowhere near where I want to end up. Yeah. You know, it just keeps going. You never quite figure it out. And I think that all goes back to the type of person you are. For me, that's a great thing. Yeah. I, I, once I, once I figure something out, I'm probably done with it. You yeah. know what I mean? And there's not really figuring out music or hit songs or what's going to work. <laughs> right. So I, I love, I love making music. I love writing music. I love what I get to do. I love playing it for the people out there. Um, I've loved having you out on shows out there yeah, too. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I feel, I feel like in life, the more grateful that I'm able to be mm. for all of that, the happier I am. And also just the better things go. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I'm guilty of getting really like, oh, I'll just be furious some days. I'm just like, I'm not talking to anybody. I'm yeah. out. I'm out. I'm quitting. I'm done. Yep. I'm going to um, take my ball and go home. Yeah. But you know, having, having little Jack Doliak and, and mm. it's, it definitely is a perspective shift and, um, and being, being independent now too, it's yeah. just been so huge. And so, um, it's good. I'm That's grateful. Awesome. I'm happy where I'm at and, uh, I'm happy to be here. I love this show by the way. Thank you. Love what you're doing. And also your music. I don't know if your music gets talked enough, enough, um, enough on here, but yeah, love your we don't music. talk about it too much, but yeah, you stay away from it, but yeah, go listen to this guy's music. <laughs> awesome. Well, Hey, thank you, Adam, so much for being here. That's it. That's the pod. That's the pod. See you later. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of 10 Year Town. If you're still listening, you must have liked it. So we hope that you will leave us a rating or review on Apple or Spotify or give us a subscription on uh, YouTube 
It's all free. Don't cost you nothing. But uh, we appreciate you being here. And uh, thank you for supporting the Tenure Town community. See you next week.